Okay, so in these notes, we're talking about making confidence intervals to try to capture the true difference in means. Like, what is the true difference between mu1 and mu2? So we've built confidence intervals in the past. Let's start with the formula for a two-sample t interval for mu1 minus mu2. Note that when we're talking about means, we're going to use the t distribution. So we start with our sample data. So we get a sample mean for the first group, sample mean for the second group. What's the difference between our two sample means? Plus minus our t score or our t critical value. And we also multiply that critical value times the standard error. So the square root and we have the sample standard deviations. That's what little s stands for. So we're going to use confidence intervals like this one to estimate what the true difference is between mu1 and mu2. Is this formula on the formula sheet the way it's written? No, unfortunately not. How about the conditions for inference when we're making this confidence interval? Uh, really, it's the same ones we're used to. We know we have to have data from a random sample or experiment. We have to have independence, which if we're sampling without replacement, we prove that with the 10% condition. And lastly, don't forget we have to have normality. So either both samples are at least 30, which is the central limit theorem, or if we have a small sample size for the samples, we have to take a look at the sample data and hope that we can just assume it came from normal parents. Okay, the next part here says, when doing two sample T procedures, should we pool the data to estimate a common standard deviation? So if you remember back when we did proportions, we actually did want a pooled proportion. But for means, that means that we would assume that the two groups, the first sample and the second sample, come from a population where the standard deviations are the exact same. So when you do a two-sample T interval in your calculator or a two-sample T test, it'll ask you if you'd like to pool the data. And if you pool, that assumes that the population standard deviation for the first group is somehow the exact same as the population standard deviation for the second group. Uh, what would the benefit be in green here? Well, po pooling it would actually increase our degrees of freedom. So that would be a good thing. However, that's not realistic at all. So it's not realistic to assume that we'd have the same standard deviations for each population. Right? That's a pretty bold assumption. So we are not going to pool our data. So as a general rule, no pooling for means. So what about the two sample test for proportions? So we said we do pool, and this is for tests for P1 minus P2. That is the only time we'll actually pool our data. And the reason we do that is because in significance tests, we start out assuming P1 and P2 are the same. And we don't do that in confidence intervals, but in significance tests for P1 minus P2, we do start out by assuming they're the same. So that's the only time we'll ever pool uh, in this class, because this assumes that P1 and P2 would be equal. Um, and if you'll recall, when we did pool, the P hat with a little C on it, which did for combined, it was the total number of successes from each sample divided by the combined sample size, so N1 plus N2. So we learned this in the last section. The only time we'll ever pool is when we're doing significance tests for P1 minus P2. We do not pool for means. So the chocolate chips example says Ashton and Olivia wanted to know if generic chocolate chip cookies have as many chocolate chips as name brand chocolate chip cookies on average. To investigate, they randomly selected 10 bags of Chips Ahoy cookies and 10 bags of Great Value cookies and randomly selected one cookie from each bag. So that seems pretty random. Randomly pick 10 bags and then randomly pick one cookie from each bag. Then they carefully broke apart each cookie and counted the number of chocolate chips in each. Here are their results. There's the Chips Ahoy data and the great value data. 
Our job is to construct and interpret a 99% confidence interval for the difference in the mean number of chocolate chip cookies in Chips Ahoy and Great Value cookies. Okay, so confidence intervals use the same four-part grading rubric as significance tests. Let's start with the state step. So let's state what we're actually going to do. We want to construct a 99% confidence interval which is going to allow us to estimate the true value for this. Mu with a little CA for Chips Ahoy minus Mu with a little GV for Great Value. And so we just need to say what these values represent in context. So mu CA and mu GV would be the true mean number of chocolate chips in a cookie from Chips Ahoy and Great Value, respectively. So we gave the confidence interval with 99%, the confidence level, how confident we want to be. Uh, we gave the parameter mu CA minus mu GV, and we defined both of those in context. So we're good for the state step. So how about the plan step? And now I've got two cookies here. So we need to start out by naming the inference method that we're going to do. So whether it's a test, whether it's an interval, is it about proportions, is it about means, right? One sample or two samples. So let's be really clear. We're going to do a two-sample t-interval for the difference in these means. We know it's two samples because we have two different means. And we know for means we use t's. So it's a two-sample t-interval. Okay, so that's the first point we'll be graded on. And now let's speak to each condition. The randomness condition, well, it says uh, they randomly chose the bags, and then they randomly chose a cookie from each bag. So it says those were randomly selected. So the randomness condition is all good. Uh, the independence condition, even if they randomly selected the cookies, technically that's a finite population, right? There's a finite number of cookies, so their sample size was really small. We could just say there are definitely more than 10 times the sample size, which is 100 Chips Ahoy cookies. And there's also more than 100 Great Value cookies. I mean, who can just eat 10 cookies at once, right? So if that's the case, the 10% condition is definitely met. Okay, and the last condition here is the normality condition. So unfortunately, we can't use the central limit theorem for means here because the sample sizes are too small. So with small sample sizes, we have to provide some evidence somehow. We could ask our calculator to graph these, but it seems really simple in this case to just make a dot plot. The smallest cookie up here, I think, is 14. The largest number, 26. So uh, let's start with just the Chips Ahoy data first. We'll go from 14 to 26. Let's get the dots down. So 10 dots. And the reason I went from 14 to 26 is I saw the great value cookies. And I'm going to make a dot plot right below this as parallel as I can. So I can, I can compare them directly if I want to. So now they're really on the same scale. And let's go ahead and get the great value cookies up here as well. And then I'm going to let the x-axis label here serve for both of these. This is just the number of chocolate chips in a cookie, right? This is the data that they got when they broke apart each cookie. So 10 is a really small sample size. And looking at both of these, uh, it doesn't look like normal, but it's not particularly skewed, right? There's no really strong skew in one direction or the other. It's not, like I said, it's not perfectly symmetric by any means, but there's no crazy skew, and there's no outliers. So as long as the graphs of our sample data, this is the comment that we have to make. Okay, look at the sample data. We don't see any strong skew. We don't see any outliers. 
That means we can assume that the two sets of data would come from approximately normal parent populations. So at this point, our conditions are all good. It's time for the do step and another cookie. So to use this interval, we're going to use our calculator. So we can say using technology in the command to sample t interval. And I'll stop here. Let's take a look at what that command does. So if we go to stat, and then over to tests, there's all sorts of choices. Z-test, T-test, proportions, samples. There's interval options. So we got to find the right one. We want a two-sample T-interval. So if we scroll down here, there we go, two-sample T-interval. So our calculator wants to know what the summary statistics are. It wants to know the sample mean and the standard deviation from the sample uh, for both the first group and the second group. And the problem never gave us the sample mean or the sample standard deviation. So we would have to calculate that ourselves, or if we tell the calculator what the data is, like enter this data into L1, this data into L2, then, for example, we could do stat, calc, one variable statistics on each data set, and then the calculator would tell us what the sample mean is, what the sample standard deviation is uh, for each group. So I've actually already entered the data into the calculator here. If I go to stat, edit, there's L1, there's L2. You should recognize that. Those are the Chips Ahoy cookies. Those are the Great Value cookies. So you've got your data entered into L1 and L2. There's actually an option under stat, tests, and when you choose the two sample T interval, instead of summary statistics as your input, tell your calculator to use the actual data as your input. And then if you enter the, enter the data into L1 and L2, tell it to look at L1 and L2. Set the confidence level. We want 99%, so 0.99. Pooled? Absolutely not. We don't pool for means. Just say no. And then go ahead and hit calculate and let the calculator do the work for you. So I've got my interval from negative 4.814 up to 2.8138. The calculator found the sample mean for the first group and the second group, as well as, as, well as the standard deviation for both. Um, one important thing you need to take with you from this is the degrees of freedom. That's always something that the grader will, grader will look for if you use the T distribution. So we can say we use technology. We got the right command. This is the interval it gave us. That's great. There's the confidence interval. And we need to say what the degrees of freedom were. So that would be using 13.145 degrees of freedom. So anytime we ever use the T distribution at all, we should really mention the degrees of freedom. And with this two-sample stuff, we know that it's just much more efficient and we get better data, better results if we let the calculator do it for us. Okay, lastly, the conclude step. This is where we need to interpret what this interval represents, what it means in context. We got a lot of practice with this in chapter eight. So we can say we are 99% confident. So we are pretty confident that this interval does something special, right? that the interval from negative 4.81 up to 2.81, and that's how you, an interval notation with parentheses here, it always goes smaller number first and then the larger number. What does that interval do that's so special? Well, we're actually pretty confident that it captures the true difference in the mean number of chocolate chip cookies for Chips Ahoy and Great Value. 
Okay, some important advice here. Anytime you're supposed to interpret things in context, I shouldn't see mu's or p's or null hypotheses or anything like that. I should just see words from the problems, like uh, true difference of chocolate chip cookies, right? Chips Ahoy in great value. I don't see any statistical notation. For example, uh, using mu and so forth doesn't score me any context points. Using words from the scenario does. Okay, and the last part here, part B. Does your interval provide convincing evidence that there is a difference in the mean number of chocolate chip cookies? So take a look at our interval. And that's supposed to represent maybe we uh, have a plausible value in there somewhere. That would be the true difference between the two means, the, two, the true population means. And there's one really important value that you should note. And that value would be zero. Because if zero's on there, that means there's no difference between the two means. So we can say, since the, since the interval includes zero, right? Zero's definitely between those two numbers. Since it includes zero, then zero might be a plausible value for this difference. Meaning we can't rule out that they might be the same, right? If we can't rule out that they might be the same, that means we don't have convincing evidence that in these words, like it says in the problem, that there's a difference in the mean number of chocolate chips. So if we had to equate that to a hypothesis test, that means we'd fail to reject, right? Since zero's on there, uh, zero might be reasonable. So we can't, we can't reject the null. If we got an interval that was all the way above zero or all the way below zero, zero wasn't on the interval, then that would be convincing evidence that we could reject the idea that there's no difference. But in this case, we don't have convincing evidence that there's actually a difference. They might be the same. Since zero's on there, zero might be a plausible value. All right, I'm going to go eat some chocolate chip cookies. That's all for confidence intervals about difference in two means for now. I'll see you in class.